Good day, grade 10s. Welcome to your next physical science lesson. Welcome to you guys if you are joining us for the first time. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to invite you to join our physical science, our grade 10 physical science class. Um, the reason I would like you to join it is, as I said before, if you join it, then you can not only message me, but you can also, what I want to do eventually is that, okay, we've got a lot of people watching the, the, the show, but not many people have joined the classes. And I would like them to join the classes, I'd like you guys to join the classes, because ideally what I would like to do is teach you a section and then give you a multiple choice quiz. It's completely anonymous. I can't see who's answering what. All I do is say, for example, there are 50 people that are answering the quiz, for example, then on, on the test itself, it might show that I don't see your working, obviously it's multiple, choice. All I see is, oh, look, out of the 50, maybe 20 people got question three wrong. Okay, there's nobody, no names, no nothing. I don't know who you are. So then what I can do is I can go and see what question three was about and I can then teach to it. Okay, I can say, okay, well, I can see you guys don't understand, I don't know, um, vectors about this type of vector. So let me go and teach it again and let me make sure you guys understand. So it's kind of targeted teaching and that was what the plan was with these lessons was to have targeted teaching. So the, soon, the only way we can really get this targeted teaching going is if you guys join the class, okay? Otherwise, I'm very happy to teach here and for you guys to get as little or as much from these lessons as you can. And I'm happy with that. Um, it just would be better for me, I suppose, if I could see if you guys were actually understanding what we were doing. But anyway, um, never mind. So. In the last couple of days, we've been doing chemical bonding and we ended at the beginning of some questions. So I've just got one or two, I think it's three exam type questions on chemical bonding and then we're going to move on to electric circuits. Okay, I know that we're quite late in the year already. So therefore, I would like to say that, um, sorry, I've got a message from my boss that says, can you show how to join your class? Okay, I think I can. Let me see if I can get this right. Um, I wasn't anticipating doing this, so let's see if I can work it out. Okay, so we go on to the to enable website, to enable.org website. And you will get a dashboard like this, okay? And on the side it says, yeah, you'll see my classrooms. I've got lots of them, grade maths 10, maths grade 11, da, 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 da. You guys, if you haven't joined, you won't have these, but there will be a subject here that says, choose subject, okay? So what you need to do is choose the subject. And whether you click, okay, and there's, all the subjects over there and let's choose a subject and I'm going to choose a subject that I'm not, I don't belong to. So let's choose, I don't know, geography. And then you will see that there's grade 10, grade 11 and grade 12. You don't have to choose any one. If you're in grade 12, but you kind of would really like to learn, get some revision on grade 10 or 11, you can join any of these classes. You can click grade 12 and then you can say, and I think you just double click here and you go back. And that's it. Let me just check if I'm right about that. Let me see what my boss says. Okay. Um, and there you go. You've done, you registered your class. Um, it's a bit different for me because I'm a mentor. So let me see if I can get out of here and sign in, log out. And I'm going to log in using... Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to start totally fresh. So this is how you would come in. So you get email address. So you would type your email address in here. And then you would, oh, you'd have to register. Sorry. So you go, and now you can see all my details. Please don't email me. <laughs> um, I'm going to change this today. Okay, so we're going to register. So you register there. Okay, and you can put in all the information. Um, do I really have to? Okay, fine. So I'm going to say I was born on the 14th of December. And I'm going to say that I was actually born in, I don't know, let's make it 91. 
and the 1st of January 91. Okay, and you tell my country and my preferred correspondence type is email and my email address and do you really want my cell phone number? Okay, they have to give it so it's going to be Okay, and the education institution, um, in this case, it'll be to enable online schools. And if it's not listed, you can just write none. You don't have to fill that in, or you can click none there. Okay, oh, no problems. Where's the cap? Okay, there we go. Okay, not all of this is true, so I don't think it is. Okay, right, then you have to choose a password. I'm going to not tell you what my password is. Okay, <laughs> and then you have to prove that you're a human being and not some random machine and you register. Okay, and it says, yay, you've registered, your username is, and you'll have already got email. Okay, now, now I can log in, I think. So let's go and log in. So, Oopsie, sorry. And what did I say it was? <laughs> okay, I don't know. Oh dear, I couldn't remember. There we go. It's saying it's wrong. That's weird. Oh, it's not letting me in. What could I possibly have done wrong? Let's say I forgot my password. What would it have done? Would it have emailed it to me? Possibly. Okay, so I'm not going to do that because this is taking time. I'm rather going to log in as myself um, and then show you. No, let's just do this properly. Okay, I'm going to slow down. That might be the problem. And then. Darn it. Okay, so let's go find out what my password is. Um, <clears throat> okay, so if you forget your password, it's not a big deal. Okay, so it hasn't recognized me. Maybe it's because I didn't go and check my email. Okay, so in that case, I'm not going to go through that because I actually don't want to show you all my emails. No offense. Um, so let's just go the normal way that I would get in. Okay, so when I choose my subject, let's just see what my boss is saying to me now. Um, all they have to do is and log in and enroll um, in the subject. They must enroll in the subject, and on the left hand side, they'll be able to access the live assessments in the upcoming days. They'll see your live sessions. It will lock you out if you get the wrong password more than three times. Thanks, boss. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's very different because I'm a mentor. So if you look at this, when it says my choose my subject, um, okay, when it says choose my subjects, yeah, it's a mentor, not to be a member of. So I actually had to choose, if you go to natural science, it says there, and I had to create place mentor grade, whereas you guys just choose your subjects, okay? And then it will choose it. There it is. It's now part of it. So mine is different because I get to mentor, whereas you guys will just have to choose your actual subject. And then like the boss has said, on the left-hand side, um, on the left-hand side, Oh, is this for the teachers? There you go. So if I choose a subject here, yeah, that's the subject to register for. Oh dear, how embarrassing. I'm so sorry, guys. Okay, right. There we go. There we go. Now, if I choose, let me start again. This is for you guys, okay? We choose a subject on the left-hand side. They must choose on the curriculum panel. Okay, thank you, boss. Okay, so you choose on the curriculum panel, not this. Okay, this is for me, not for you. So you will get a curriculum learner and teacher resources and you choose the subject there. Okay, and then it's going to come up with all these different subjects. And let's pick life sciences. Now, at the moment, there are only lessons in maths and life sciences. Okay, but let's just choose life sciences because I've read all of them already. So I'm going to choose grade 12 caps and you're going to enroll. Okay, now it says I'm enrolled in grade life science grade 12. Okay, now what will happen is if you go 
Okay, I've done that already. Thanks, boss. Then he says, okay, then if you go and look, it will say, okay, on the, on the left hand side, you'll be able to access the assessments. Okay, so if you get rid of the messaging and more messaging, then there'll be these things here. It says, yeah, upcoming events, revision, live assessments, messaging, and help. Okay, and if you click on the upcoming events, they're all the lessons. Ta da! Okay, so then if you go press on one of these, which I'm not going to do because that's going to be weird because then you're going to be watching me doing this lesson and I think my computer will probably have a nervous breakdown. So, but if you press this button here, yeah, your event, you will get through a whole bunch of buttons. Let's see if it does it. Let's see what will happen. Okay, so it says here, yeah, it turn enables online, grade 10, science online, can anybody go? Yes, da da da. Open TV, live TV link. Let's see what happens. I haven't done this. I haven't actually watched myself have a lesson. You're probably going to get feedback. Okay. And then what you do is you do not sign in as an event team member because that's me. Okay. Me and my boss and whoever else. Okay. My boss and I. You will do the join the event. You click the join the event as a guest. And there's a little bit of a lag, which I'm kind of counting on. And you will see that it will start sometime very soon. And she watched myself. There you go. So there you get the video. Okay, so you can actually see the video and what is going on. Okay, so there it is. Then you can press this button here. You see the big green button on the right hand side. It says message studios. So you can click the message studio and it says please type a message to the studio. Hi there. I need help with trig functions please okay and you press send okay and the message has been sent and then if you go okay now you won't see this but i get to see this okay and i have got okay fine, okay and if i go over here i will see that there is um you it will see the message for me so my message on screen i will get a new message on the right hand side there now the way it works guys is that um the messages if i'm busy teaching you seriously then obviously i might not be able to answer you while i'm messaging you okay but because obviously my powerpoint screen will be up and i've got a second separate laptop where the messaging comes in however if Gosh, I feel like I'm seeing in, in infinity. Okay, but however, um, I will watch. Um, uh, can he not hear me now? Can you not hear me now? Okay. Um, so now that's the video. Okay. So now you can see that. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. So I just want to see if it's saying that you can hear me. Okay. Right. So that's how you do it. And it says, okay, we do you well. Thank you. So as my boss says, it'll also add then a grade a life signs to the home screen. So if you go back to your dashboard, okay, let's go back to the dashboard. It will actually add the life sciences because I chose life sciences. It's going to choose there. You go. You can see that there it is. The life sciences grade 12. Okay. Now, what's cool about that is that just because we're giving lessons on math and science doesn't mean that you guys can't access all the subjects that you're doing because they're all represented here. And there's hundreds and hundreds of resources. There are exam papers. There's question papers. There's tests. There's answers. There's videos. There's um, worksheets, everything on here, not just for math and science, but for all the subjects. So please feel free to go and look at it and join up. Um, and that's it. Okay, so now, now that you know how to join, I'm going to carry on with the lesson. And like I said, um, 
I'm going to carry on with chemical bonding. So what I'm going to do is I want to go through three questions with you guys about the chemical bonding. And remember we were talking about different types of bonding. We were talking about covalent bonding, ionic bonding, and metallic bonding. And we were talking about the different types of compounds that you could get and the different types of compounds based on the bonds. So what I said to you guys that I really wanted you to do in the last lesson was to read through the notes or re-watch the video. By the way, if if you don't get, if you miss something in the video, feel free to go through exactly the same process that you did to get to this video. Okay, so in other words, where it says upcoming events, you can go look at expired events and then go and click there and then you'll see a, a, a recording of the video. Okay, so anyway, I, would like, I said I'd like you to go through the video and make sure you understand the bonds so that you can help me go through these questions and answer them correctly. So let's go through it. It says, from the following table, identify the compound that is most likely an ionic solid, an ionic solid. Okay, so remember we've got covalent bonding. There's ionic and there's metallic. Okay, and metallic has got that C of delocalized electrons. Remember that I said to you that if ever you ever ask anything about bonding with metals, you want to say the word C of delocalized electrons. Your covalent bonding is going to be the sharing of electrons and ionic is the transfer of electrons. Remember this? Okay, now it says, from the following table, identify the compound that is most likely to be the ionic solid. So we've got A, B, C, and D. D's got the highest melting points and boiling points. And remember, melting point is the temperature at which it goes from a solid to a liquid and vice versa. And the boiling point is from a liquid to a gas. So you can see that from this point alone, from these points, the ones with the lowest melting points and lowest boiling points have got the weakest, the weakest forces, right, or bonds. And the ones that have got the highest boiling points and the highest melting points are going to be the strongest. Okay, going to be the strongest. Okay. Right, now what else do we know? We also know that we're looking for something ionic. So immediately I'm thinking it needs to be crystalline. Okay, because remember I said to you, it, it breaks along the planes because it forms, remember it forms a large crystal. It forms a large macro molecule. So as soon as I see anything that says crystalline, I'm gonna go for it. So this is a weakly bonded molecular solid. That is not crystalline, so that's wrong. Molecules are your covalent bonding. These are molecules, okay? Right, and again, no. Yeah, we've got a hard, brittle, crystalline solid soluble in water, ting, and hard, soluble in, in crystalline solid. Okay, maybe ting. Okay, but now, Let's have a look at this. So both of these are hard and crystalline. The thing for me that's going to make me choose C is for the fact that it's soluble in water. Remember I said to you guys that, um, I said to you that what special I love asking, they love asking in exams, is they'll say there is a substance that it does not, um, that does not conduct electricity in water as a solid, but does conduct electricity as as a liquid, as in when it is dissolved in water. And the correct answer for that would have been an ionic solution. So this cannot be an ionic solution because it is insoluble in water. And we know that ionic solutions are soluble in water because they then become your nice, beautiful electrolytes. So therefore, my answer that I would choose is C. Another clue is the fact that it's brittle and we've said in the last lesson that your ionic solids are brittle because they have got this beautiful crystalline lattice that they break up along. Okay, happy. So now let's move on to the next type of question. Okay, now it says use Lewis notation to represent the following molecules. So you've got carbon dioxide and oxygen. So the first thing you need to do is remember that Lewis notation are your dots and crosses. Dots and crosses. 
Okay, don't get confused between this and the Cooper notation. The Cooper notation is just your straight lines, your lines, okay? Dots and crosses is Lewis. And the first thing you need to do is look at your periodic table. And why do you need to look at your periodic table? Because you need to look for the number of valence electrons. So carbon, let's do the first one first, carbon dioxide, is made up of carbon, obviously, which is in group four. There it is, is in group four. And if it's in group four, it's got four valence electrons, okay. Oxygen is in group six, okay. So it's got six valence electrons. Right, so now we're going to start with drawing a carbon, okay. And do you remember what I said to you was special about carbon? I said that normally, let's, let's say I had to draw the valence electrons of oxygen, how would I do it? I would go oxygen, okay, I'd actually write oxygen. Then what would I do? I would go one, two, because those two electrons are in my 1s orbital, right? And then I'd go three, four, five, six. And the reason we do that is to show that the electrons are filling up their orbitals separately, slowly, right? So you'd say that, okay, fine, I obviously have a gap here and I have a gap here. Awesome. So that's how we would do it with oxygen. Carbon, remember, is special because carbon, when it joins up with anything, when it bonds, it gets excited. One of the little electrons from the Wenis orbital get excited and it ends up having a one, two, three, four. They split up so that one of the electrons is no longer in the S orbital and you now have one electron in each of the orbitals. Okay, so that is what we've got. So now if we draw that, we end up here with carbon with one, two, three, four. And the reason that's important is because that's how you get end up getting two oxygens joining onto it and how they end up being linear. Because then what happens is this dude here is going to come in and fit in here. So he's going to fit in here and he's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, and yes, I'm doing it wrong, but I've just shown you how to do it here, okay? So I'm just filling it in here. Now, exactly the same thing is going to happen over here, okay? Because do you see now we've got this is a shared pair of electrons there, that's a shared pair of electrons. So these, this, ox, this electron here and this electron needs both need pairs. So we end up with an oxygen over here. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it in a different color so you don't get confused. So here is oxygen. Yes, it's it's mm, a single electron. And then I'm just going to fill in this slot over here, where it's going to be over here and over here and over here and over here. So then there are your other two shared pairs of electrons. So you can see that carbon dioxide is a linear molecule. And if you had to use Cooper notation, it would be C double bonded O, double bonded O. Okay, so it's very important that you know that carbon does this little thing where one of the electrons jumps up into a p orbital. Remember I showed it to you, I said that look, it's normally 2s, and normally what would expect to happen is you'd end up with 2s, look at carbons in group, in period two. So this would be 2s2 and then you'd be in, have 2p and then it would be 1, 2. That's what we'd expect, okay? But when it bonds, this little dude here, one of these two, gets super excited and it goes up there. So it frees up that. We end up not having that there, okay? So there's a free space for an electron to be shared and we end up with another electron over there. So now we've got four orbitals all just waiting for electrons to be shared, which is why we draw it like this. Okay, and that's very important. So guys in grade 10, I know it seems a bit much to be learning about this, but if you understand this now, then you will really, it'll really help you with the rest of your chemical bonding. Also carbon plays a huge role in your grade 12 chemistry curriculum. So you really need to know this. Okay, so now let's look at how we would write the Lewis notation for oxygen. Okay, so oxygen we've just said is, first of all, this is diatomic molecule, and oxygen we've just said is in group six. It's in group six, okay? Sorry, group six. 
So it has got six valence electrons and we've just shown you how we would do it. That we've got an oxygen here and then we go one, two, because that's in the S orbitals, because here it is. Those are the two in the S orbitals. And then it's one, two, three. So it's two, three, four, five, and six. And now you can see that we've got an empty space over here and we've got an empty space over here. And then we can obviously, and you guys don't have to do it in different colors. You can just use a normal color and just do dots and crosses. I obviously have the facility to do for different colors. So I would do one, two, okay, three, okay, let's do it in dots. So it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, and there's six. And then these are my two shared pairs. And obviously it's in a new because it's two, two atoms. Okay, so that's how you would draw your molecules using the Lewis notation. Okay, so please make sure you know how to do this and practice, practice, practice. Okay, now it says, what type of chemical bonding do you expect to form between the following pairs? Give the bonding type and the chemical formula for the compound. So if you're thinking chemical bonding, what type of chemical bonding? Again, you're expecting to think either covalent or ionic or metallic. But guys, metallic just occurs within a metal, within um, a metal. So we don't really have to consider metallic. So we're only trying to decide if something is covalent and ionic. And if you look at this, you've got aluminium and chloride and hydrogen and sulfur. And what they're really asking is about the electronegativity. They're saying, what is going on about the electronegativity? So what we need, again, is a periodic table. And here we are using our electronegativity values on our periodic table. We're going to work out the electronegativity differences between, for example, aluminium and chloride. And then we're going to be using our groups so that we can, oopsie, sorry. So we can not only write the type of chemical bond, but also write the chemical formula. So let's do it. So we've got aluminium, which is in group three. And we've got chlorine, which is in group seven. Okay, so if aluminium is in group three, do you agree that it's got a valency of three electrons? Okay, we could actually do it like this. We've got aluminium and it's in group three, so it's got a valency of three electrons. Remember how the valencies work? It's one, two, three, four, three, two, one, zero. It is the number of bonds it can make. And remember, it's to do with whether or not the electrons are gained or lost. So if they're lost, it becomes plus, and if they're gained, it's minus. So in this case, aluminium, we're going to choose to lose electrons, okay, because there's less energy required. So its valency is aluminium three plus. Chlorine's in group seven, so it has a valency of Cl minus minus one really okay so do you remember that i said to you that you could just swap these so it become aluminium cl3 so that is our formula it's aluminium chloride alcl3 the other way of thinking about it if you struggle with the swapping is that aluminium has got three arms one two three okay and chlorine has got one arm to bond so therefore we need three little chlorines to join up to every aluminium. Okay, now we need to decide what type of bonding it is. So the aluminium's electronegativity, so aluminium's electronegativity is 1,5, I'm reading over here, and chlorine's electronegativity, hmm. oh yes, that's fine, sorry, chlorine's electronegativity is 3. So the electronegative difference is what? It is 3 minus 1 comma 5, which is 1 comma 5, which means that it is what? It is ionic. Okay, it is ionically bonded because the electronegativity difference is so big. Okay, now let's look for hydrogen and sulfur. So hydrogen's in group 1 and sulfur is in group six okay so again let's talk about the valency it's one 
two, three, four, three, two, one, and zero. Okay, so therefore we could say that hydrogen has got a valency of one, or you could just do it as hydrogen plus. The re remember how we got this two? The two was that we said that sulfur has got six electrons. It's actually got a va six valence electrons, which means its options are either two, lose six, or gain two. So therefore it's gonna choose to gain two because of the energy con considerations. So therefore it has got two, it's got a valency of to gain two electrons. So sulfur has got a valency of two. So if we just had to do that cross thingy where we just transfer them, it becomes H2S. The other way, remember, is to say, well, sulfur's got two arms, so therefore I need another hydrogen to fill in there, so therefore it is H2S. Okay, now we need to decide what type of bonding we have. The electronegativity of hydrogen is 2,1. And the electronegativity of sulfur is 2,5. Therefore, the difference is 2,5 minus 2,1, which is 0,4. So this is definitely covalent definitely covalently bonded. Because remember that the, as close as the difference gets to zero, the more pure covalent it is. And I'm not even going to go into polar covalent because we didn't discuss that at all. Okay, so therefore we can say it's covalent. Right, now let's start with electric circuits. Okay, so we're going to start off with doing a little bit of revision on um, a little bit of revision on what you should already know from grade nine, and then we're going to move on. So let's talk about potential energy. When a circuit is closed, the charge can move through the circuit. Okay, the electrons can move through the circuit. In order for this to happen, there has to be a force which acts on the charge doing the work. Okay, the electrons don't just automatically start moving around the, the circuit. So there's a for this force, and I'm saying force, but it's not really a force. This force is provided by the battery. You can think of it as an energy supply. It's provided by the battery, okay? The battery has potential energy that is converted into electrical energy. So now let's talk about the potential difference. You guys need to know the definitions, okay? These are very important definitions. And what's important as well about them is that you need to know them word perfectly. Okay, um, the reason being that the department has decided that since there are so few seriously theoretical things that you need to learn in science, I know some of you thinking, oh, but all of it's theory. No, it's not, because if you understand the basic theory, then a lot of it is working out, okay? So the theory they consider is the definitions. And they say that since there's so little of the theory, you need to know it word perfect. Okay, that's one reason. Okay, so the potential difference is defined as the work done per unit charge. In other words, they're saying, if you've got a circuit, let's say you've got, this is a battery, right? And you've got a little circuit and um, there's a little bottom style light bulb and you are to get an electron to go from the negative through the circuit through to the positive end of the battery. Okay, the work done to get that one charge around the circuit, that is called the potential difference. It's the work done per unit charge, okay? So the, it's measured in volts. It's measured in volts. Please note that I'm just using electron as an analogy because this is per unit charge. The charge in the electron is 1.6 times by 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Okay, whereas we're going to be talking about per one coulomb. So it's a whole bunch of these electrons. Okay, so the di potential difference is measured in volts. So the equation is V is equal to W over Q, and this is on your formula sheet. It is on your formula sheet, so you don't need to learn it, but you do need to be able to use it. So W is going to, st V stands for potential difference in volts. W stands for your work done in joules, okay, and Q is your charge in coulombs. And you can see here that the symbols are V for volts, W for work, and Q for coulombs. 
Okay, pure charge in coulombs. Also note the work done is in joules. And what's the other thing that we measure in joules? We measure energy in joules. So the work done or the energy used, it's the same thing. So we use energy to get the work done. So it's the same thing. So this could have been energy. Okay, and the reason I mention that is because sometimes they're a bit sneaky. Instead of saying the work done was or so much per unit charge, they sometimes say the energy use. So I'm just kind of highlighting that fact. Okay, so let's talk about a voltmeter. These are two different types of voltmeters. This is the voltmeter that you usually get at school. Okay, that's the type of voltmeter you usually get at school. If you are lucky, your voltmeter at school might have a central zero. Okay, this voltmeter has got a zero on the one side, okay, so it reads one way. But if you are lucky, your voltmeter will have a central zero. And when we talk about volts a little bit, well, maybe I'll tell you now, we'll see. Um, it's important because, yeah, okay, because the voltage can be read either way. It doesn't have to be read one way. So the voltmeter in the instrument used for measuring the potential difference between two points. So it measures the amount of work done to get the charge between two points, right? That's what it's saying. It's saying that if we have two points on a circuit, let's draw a circuit again, and let's say we've got one resistor here, R, and we've got another resistor here, R, um, two, and let's say I put a voltmeter across here. I put a voltmeter across here. Then it's measuring the amount of work per unit charge it took to get through that resistor. That's what it's doing. Or if you want to think of it this way, it's measuring the amount of energy it used, the unit charge used to get through that resistor. That's what the voltmeter is measuring. Okay. And as you can see from my diagram, the voltmeter is always connected in parallel. So it's not part of the circuit. And the reason for this is because it's got a very high resistance. Okay. So what it does is it doesn't participate. It doesn't take part. It doesn't affect the flow of the charge. If it did, then it wouldn't be able to measure the amount of energy, right? So all it does is measure the amount of energy over here and the amount of energy then subtracts the two. Okay. And then it says, ah, well, the difference is how much energy or work done was energy was used to get through that resistor. Okay. So now I want to check the difference between your EMF and potential difference. And if you guys ever, ever, ever want to go and find some nice, I don't want to see what I'm looking for. If you want to go and look for some very nice um, animations or basically little flash animations that you guys can use, um, then go look at this website. You just have to type in PHET, okay? It stands for basically your physics thing. Um, I'm just going to see if I can get this on here. It's supposed to go and join. Um, otherwise, I'm going to have to go through the internet, which I will do if I have to. Is it just slow? What's going on? It doesn't seem to be doing anything. So let us, I um, don't have enough patience for this. So let's just go to the interweb. And go and find it. Basically, what happens is that what's supposed to have happened on that was that I could go and through the, the, the browser, I mean the website, and have a look. So it doesn't matter. I can just show you from here. So these are hundreds of little animations that you guys can use, and you can actually use it to try and help you understand what is going on when you are working on something. So I'm just going to quickly do this. The reason I want to show you this is because what I'm going to show you is the difference between potential difference and Let me just show you. I want to show you the difference. I just want to see if it's actually coming up at all. No, it's not. The difference between EMF and potential difference. So where is it? There we go. And let's get it going. What the heck happened there? Never mind that. 
Never mind all that, where is it? Hmm. Hmm. That's weird. It hasn't done that to me before. Um, I'm wasting time. Okay, I don't know why this isn't working. It did work. You know what I could do in a minute? Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so let me show you this now. Um, and this actually isn't the one I wanted. So let's go back. So let me just draw for you what I wanted, okay? So let me just show you. I'm sorry, I did try something new and it didn't work. So let me just get rid of this and let me show you. And then what we'll do is I'll get the demo working for the next lesson. So let me show you. Right, so the difference between EMF and potential difference is this. EMF is the maximum voltage the battery or cell, the cell or battery can supply a circuit, okay? Whereas potential difference is the amount of voltage actually used, okay? And there's a difference. There is a difference. And the reason the diff there's a difference is because, and I'll explain this first for you, is, oh, we've almost run out of time. Okay, well, let me quickly explain this to you, and then you know what I'll do? I'll make sure this animation works, or this flash thing works for you guys for the next lesson. And today is Thursday, so the next lesson's on Tuesday. So I will make sure that it works for you, and I'll show you how it works. But basically what happens is you have a very basic cell. Okay, we call them batteries when we go and buy them in the shop, but there is a very basic cell. Okay, and let's say that we have got a light bulb across the cell. Okay, so what happens is the electrons go through your wire from the negative end okay through to the positive end okay the positive end from the negative end to the positive end and obviously there is some usage of electrons here but if you had to cut open the cell please don't do this just trust me on this um and the reason i don't want you to cut it open is because there's acid very strong acid in the cells you will find a core which is usually made out of it depends on the battery maker, but it's usually made out of graphite, okay? And around this, around this, there is like a muddy paste all the way around it. There is a muddy paste with a whole bunch of chemicals which are very acidic, so please don't go and cut it open. Okay, but the point is that this here forms a solution that has got electrons in it. So electrons get pulled into here, okay, they have to get, somehow get through all this paste, okay, to be pulled back out here, okay, because what happens is electrons form a chain reaction. So if, for example, one electron here is sucked into the positive end, then it's going to form a little gap, right? So then an electron fills that, then an electron fills that, then an electron fills that. Okay, it's a very basic analogy, but you get it. That's why when you quit, switch your lights on, they turn on immediately. It's not that one electron has to go all the way around the circuit. There's a chain reaction of electrons. So exactly the same thing happens in, yeah, but this is a paste. So because of that, there is what is called internal resistance. Internal resistance. And the more electricity you try and pull out of the battery, the greater the internal resistance. And I'll explain it all to you in the next lesson because we run out of time. But I will make sure that this animation works so I can actually show you the, about the difference between EMF and potential difference. Right, guys, um, I hope that you learned something in today's lesson um, and you will join our class. And I hope that you will join us again on Tuesday at the same time and I'll carry on teaching you about electricity and electric circuits. Have a great day.